All right, welcome to Hero Thoughts. Uh, we are talking about Hawkeye episode three today. I'm Joey Massio, and that's Ben Pugh. Yep. There? And wherever I am. And I never know which way you are. Uh, yeah, so we are life coaches, and the whole purpose of this uh, uh, show is to pull out life-changing lessons and self-coaching principles from your favorite hero shows and uh, movies. And Hawkeye episode three was a wild ride. Yeah, and just side note, my wife thinks the whole purpose of this show is to give me a good excuse to watch Hawkeye. <laughs> right, I, I had told my wife too, hey babe, I, I, it's work. I, I, I gotta like, work. <laughs> I, I, I gotta work, you take care of the kids, I gotta watch this show, sorry. Um, yeah, that's really just our excuse. All right, so episode three starts off by switching perspectives. I love it when a show does this. They do this a lot more now. Back before, villains were just lame, right? Villains were one-sided, like James Bond villains. You know, one-sided, nothing special to them, uh, nothing emotional, no emotional tie-in. But Echo has an emotional tie-in. Uh, we see her backstory. She's deaf, right? She is a young kid in a class where it's not a special class just for deaf students. And we get to see her her dad, uh, and they talk, and we get to see how smart Echo is. She's deaf, but she ain't dumb. All right? And she finished her work way before everybody else did. And if you notice what she filled in on that, like go back and watch and pause what she filled in. It's uh, crazy on that, like um, that workbook that she did. The game she plays were Solitaire and I Spy, which is perfect for a kid who's deaf, right? I mean, she's usually by herself and she has to use her other senses. Uh, she also mentioned she wants to, I think, run or be as fast as a dragon, which comes in later with her dad. And then the whole conversation with her dad, like that was just so like emotional and all that. Right, Ben? Yeah, I love kind of where we're going. Like we're validating villains and I, you see that in the movie, like we have a movie about oh, Cruella DeVille, like we just we want to know about the villains and we want to like them. And so I feel like here they do their best to kind of put you in the villain's corner. Like, Oh, of course she's mad. I'd be mad. Like it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And I, I love how they did that. Well, and, and it's funny because if your brain just said, why are we validating villains, right? They're evil. They're this, they're that. Yeah, comic book ones or whatever have always been painted for that. But in real life, the real life application here is that the person in your life you're probably viewing as a villain isn't one-sided, isn't just a jerk, isn't just rude. Isn't They have their own backstory and there might be a reason why they're showing up uh, as your villain or taking actions that's leading you to label them as your villain. And they have justified reasons in their own head. Yeah. And if we were to put villains in the model somewhere, they'd be a circumstance, which means that they're neutral and we get to choose how we think about them. And at that point, yeah, I am choosing. I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to fight for this. But at Disney is just helping us prove that circumstances, they're neutral. Like this Echo character, she's just doing her best, guys. She's just doing her best <laughs> doing her best and so we get her backstory where ronin comes in and kills uh her dad now we find out that her dad is the tracksuit mafia so he was a bad guy about whatever term bad guy means on but, some level like yeah. low level like the tracksuit mafia from everything i've seen of them <laughs> it seemed like goofballs yeah <laughs> yeah but they're still doing bad things right we don't know exactly know what bad things i mean like stealing things doing whatever blowing up uh, walls and things like that so um so then after the uh the opening title cuts we, we get to see hawkeye meet maya lopez aka echo and there they've been strapped to these uh, mechanical uh like what a unicorn and like a, a lion or something like those little things that you put a quarter in and they like yes. rock back and forth for and we find minutes. out that it's an old kb toy store factory which is awesome because you teens probably have no idea what a kb toy store was but which ben and I, do i oh you you never gone to a kb toy store is it like uh it was before to like toys r us kids toys r us was different kb toys was like 
I mean, they were big and there it was a chain. And then they, you know, when the internet happened, they all went under. So this is That's just what happened to Toys R Us. <laughs> what happened with Toys R Us, right? If you don't adapt, then you get left behind. Um, so I, you know what? I was upset. The one part I was upset about the most is when they said the comment, because Kate starts coaching a tracksuit dude, the goofiest one of them all, <laughs> right? Because he's like, oh, and he like starts confiding in her about his, uh, he bought his girlfriend Imagine Dragon tickets as a gift and then they got in a fight and now she's taking her sister. And Kate said, well, the best thing is that you don't have to go see Imagine Dragons. It's like, I like him. I, I, I do too. Like yeah. I connected with that dude right there. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, I like imagine dragon. And I'm like, what are they saying here? That the weird goofball Russian mafia people, like those are the only people who like Imagine Dragons. I love Imagine Dragons. But uh yeah, I do too. That, aside from that, I love that Kate is coaching him, right? On how to change his thoughts so he can uh, you know, I don't know, get different results here. And that's a powerful example, by the way. Like Simple, simple answer. But when you're in the thick of your own life and what's going on, it's really hard to see it. That's why it's so powerful to have an outside unbiased perspective be like, oh, but what if you just thought of it this way? And he's like, oh, yeah. Uh, an another thing close to, I guess it's right after this, when Echo comes out, uh, guys, this is human behavior. We seek to connect with people and disney knows us that's why they had us connect with the villain but we see echo first thing she realizes is hawkeye's got a hearing aid that's common ground we can connect there and she goes on to kind of coach him you rely too much on that and i think that'll come back to the story somewhere i think well it came back this episode even right when his uh his hearing aid got broken she steps on it yeah. And now I just, Kate had to like, listen to the phone call, hurry and write it down. Yeah. All but, that, Th that will definitely be coming up later. By the end of this episode, he gets his earpiece back in. Right. But that's definitely going to be coming up him and echo, especially because we know that echo has her own spinoff show. She's not going to be full baddie, right? She's not gonna be full bad guy. Uh, they're going to have something to, she, he's going to learn something from echo. That's, that's kind of my um, prediction here. Uh, but another great moment is when Echo gets a flash, like they're talking and, and it's not going anywhere. Right. And, um, and Kazi, who's Echo's kind of like second person, right. Um, is like, this isn't going anywhere. She, uh, Echo gets a flash of her dad being killed by Ronan and automatically, uh, automatically she has her thought, whatever the thought is, we don't know fully, but the thought comes to the front of her mind that increases her anger and she like gets Kate in a chokehold and Kate starts freaking the heck out. And then eventually the bad guys walk away and Kate's in freak out mode. And then Hawkeye coaches her and he says, now is not the time to be scared. We are going to get out of this. This is her thought was clearly I'm going to die and his thought was, we are going to get out of this, which is how he's able to maintain his cool throughout all of this. It's the same thing. Like You guys will never be in that situation, but in a situation where you're talking with someone in a social situation and you want to come across more cool and less anxious, you got to channel a thought like this. I'm going to get out of this. Everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And the cool thing is Hawkeye has no idea. Like no, he chances are like maybe only one of them gets out and it's probably him, but that doesn't help her in the moment that like slows her down. And so you see what Hawkeye is doing is basically saying those thoughts lead to fear, mm -hmm. which are going to create actions that will not create the result that you want, which is getting out of here. And we can't 100% control that result. But if you think this way, you'll feel more confidence, you'll take better actions, and you're more likely to survive. He doesn't say that. He's like, no, we're getting out of this. Yeah. But yeah, I love that you brought that up. So much coaching in this episode. There's so much, right? <clears throat> and then after all that drama, right, and stuff and conversation, it goes into like a 20-minute escape scene, right? The fight scene was amazing. The bow and arrow tricks that, the, that they're both doing, um, all the way to the car chase. Uh, all that stuff. He's driving backwards, shooting arrows, and then he shoots the Pym arrow into the air. It was funny. I was watching on my phone 
and I was taking notes. So it was even smaller. And I didn't see that it said Pim on it. And he shoots it up in the air. And all of a sudden it turns huge. And I'm like, when did this become a cartoon comedy, man? Like what in the world? And then I went back and I saw, oh, it says Pim on it. Did you catch that, Ben? I missed it. I saw that it said Pim. I didn't notice the arrow getting huge. Well, that was the thing that dropped on the, the car, remember? Oh, gotcha. He, he shoots one arrow up in the air and then like, and- And, and just yeah. them all, gotcha. I just thought it exploded. Thank you. I'm going to have to go rewatch that now. Yeah. Um, during the fight scene, oh no, the escape scene though. So Hawkeye's earpiece is broken. I love the communication between <laughs> the two. Like she would say something, he wouldn't hear it and he would say something. Yeah. And after the escape scene, <clears throat> she's like, I should probably feed the dog. Yeah. <laughs> and Hawkeye like tells walk her, the walk the dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Hawkeye tells her um, like just a handful of things. And then at the end, and you should probably walk the dog. They're getting on the same page. They're coming together. And well, at one point in that moment, that's when she gets her validation from her hero. He says, you're right. You are one of the best uh, archers in the yeah, world. That's what I was going to mention. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I just told your thunder. That's exactly what you're going to no, say. Yeah, but that's perfect. It, you okay. made it sound way cooler. <laughs> that's what I do. That's what, okay. So um, they get away and then we have a couple of more dialogue scenes, that touching phone call scene where Hawkeye can't hear his son as a dad with a son about that age, right? Like I'm like, <laughs> you know, and he's like so great. And at the end, it's so great to hear your voice. You know, and I'm like, he can't, he can't hear your voice. Um, all that was super touching, but notice that's only touching because of what they built up, right? All the thoughts that we know his family uh, are having about they want him there, the thoughts that he wants to be home, right? Where it, it, that, that scene is not automatically touching for everybody, right? A father who could care less about being home with his kid and they exist, right? Not as touching for him. He would not like, or if this was a character where he was really into his work uh, over his kids, it, it would be much different. But he has a thought, I want to be a good dad. And that's what makes this touching which is great, which is what I think most people shoot for. I want to be a good father. And which is why that scene probably resonates with most of us. Yeah. Uh, one thing to back it up though, a little bit when they're being interrogated by echo, this is where TV shows, like they have the power to create their own reality. And as I'm watching this, I'm like, how does no one know that he is Ronan? Like, or the Ronan, like, why else would he care and be saving this girl? Why? I, I guess he's Hawkeye and he has that going for him. Like, oh, he's just a good guy. He does good things. He saves people. But like we know, and I think Echo starts to question this, like, why are you doing this? Mm. And like, how are you so sure that, that he's she's dead. not? Yeah, that he's yeah. dead. Oh, because Black, Widow, Black Widow. Oh, that's convenient that yeah. the person who, like, there's going to be some point, like we all know and we get it, but there's going to be, I think that's going to be one of the bigger things here. Like, I think Hawkeye and Echo, there's a possibility that they join forces and they kind of combine. And then that's where this bigger piece of drama unfolds that, you're the guy that killed my father. Yeah, that, that's going to, yeah, that's true. If they connect first and then she finds out that he's the guy that killed her father, like that, I mean, that's, that's going to be big stuff there. And how are they both going to handle that? You know? And it will impact Hawkeye because he knows, and we see it right now. This is probably the point that we're getting to right now, but he knows he was the Ronan and he feels immense shame about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. And that's the scene that's coming up. Uh, you just reminded me that whole, like, he wasn't lying, by the way, when he said Black Widow killed uh, the Ronin. Black Widow's the one who saved him, remember? Uh, uh, in Endgame, she's the one who gets him and brings him back from that dark path. And so he's technically right when he says she killed the Ronin, but it's not the way that Echo thinks that he's And dead he yet. was there. <laughs> he, was that. he was there. He was there, right? So um, then we have a scene where Echo talks with Kazi. Right. And um, Kazi's like, we shouldn't be going after Ronan and says, uncle might find out. Now, remember in the flashback scene, um, 
uh, at the very beginning with Echo, we see her, her dad toss her off to the care of Uncle. Oh, Uncle is going to take care of you. So there's some mysterious figure called Uncle. They're not showing us his face because we know who he is, or we wouldn't know who he is if we saw his face. Which means we know who he is right now. <laughs> exactly. We know who he is. Uh, and apparently he's still running things. He's still around. I still think it's Wilson Fisk. Just the 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 build of that guy that we saw like just from his waist down. He looked huge. It looked like it was Wilson Fisk, uh, which again would be an amazing crossover if that's the uncle they're talking about. Um, but Kazi's having second thoughts like, hey, you, we shouldn't be going after him. And then she says, uh, this is all through sign language. Um, if this was my dad, if I was my dad, would you question him? You know? And then he said, he always put the crew first. So again, her thoughts are getting her away from the results that she probably wants over revenge. This is always the classic revenge tale, right? The thoughts that we have create this feeling of venge, of, of vengefulness that we, we need to get, you know, um, and it makes us forget about all the other thoughts that give us the results that we want, like protecting the people around us now. Yeah. So, I love it. What's the name of the fiance in Hawkeye? Uh, you mean Jack? Yeah, that's who I think is uncle. You think, uh, maybe, I don't think so. I think he already has a play here, um, like and, and a, a different kind of path, but uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see who's right. Um, so he gets his, air, uh, his earpiece fixed. We're talking in the restaurant. In the restaurant, we get Hawkeye's main thoughts. His story about himself that is stopping him from being the type of hero we all want him to be. And the thought is this, because she's saying, here's a better costume design. And he said, I can't wear a flashy costume for three reasons. One, I'm a ghost. Two, my wife will kill me. And three, the actual thought driving him right now is I am not a role model to anyone. And that's because of his days as the Ronin. He's feeling guilt. He's feeling shame. He didn't murder a bunch of people, whether you're cool with that or not, because they were all villains. Whatever your take is on that right now for him, that's what's bringing him down. I am not a role model to anyone. Yeah. And like when you said, whatever your take is on that, irrelevant. Like we see his take on yeah. that, no. that I'm not good enough. I'm not. Like I made this huge mistake and I, in his mind, <clears throat> yeah, they're bad guys, but he went and sought them out. Like no, no longer is he like protecting the people he loves and no, he's out for blood. He lost his family with the snap and was pissed off and just out killing people. And that's how he views that. Yeah. It's crazy. And then notice what Kate does immediately. Kate starts to point out all the evidence that he is a role model and it doesn't work. Have you ever had this happen where friends try to tell you like you're in a bad mood and friends like, oh, look, just cheer up. Look, there's this, there's that, there's that. And it doesn't work because that's because you don't believe the thoughts they're trying to offer and the evidence that they're presenting, even though it's there for you to see your brain's rejecting because you're like, nope, I'm not accepting that. I'm not looking at that evidence to support this story that would make me feel better. I'm going to focus on the evidence over here that will keep me feeling in this, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Indulgent emotion of guilt and shame and all that and not make me feel any better. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Okay. The, the rest of the show goes on. I mean, like they're talking in the park, the tracks, the tracksuit guys uh, allude again to another uh, higher guy than them. We know it's uncle. Um, there's, uh, they, they break into the penthouse. They break into mom's penthouse, which really isn't breaking in. They walk in. She lives there. They, they go to mom's penthouse. She hacks mom's computer, which I guess isn't really hacking because she knows mom's password for some reason. Knows mom's password. Uh, she researched Kazi and we get a little bit of information on him. He works for Sloan Limited. Now, if I knew more comic book lore, I would know what that's from. Right now, I don't. And I'm leaving myself in the mystery. I like the mystery. We don't know what Sloan Limited is. Um, she gets locked out when she searches for Jack. So either mom is protecting her fiance, Jack, or somebody at that company is protecting Jack. But that's when she gets locked out. Kate gets locked out from the computer. And then we end with Clint hearing something in the house, walking down, 
and Jack putting the Ronin sword to the former Ronin's neck. Throat. Yeah, yeah right to his throat. <clears throat> Throat's in the neck, Ben. <laughs> uh, I know, but it just sounds more threatening. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, and right there, and then that's where we end. Is episode four going to start with them in a big fight? Probably, maybe just a conversation. Who knows? But uh, we're there, and now there's a little bit more reckoning that's going to have to to happen. Yeah, and I don't know that they get in a big fight. Like that definitely pushes Hawkeye closer to having to admit that he was the Ronan. And I think somehow they're going to delay that as long as possible. Yeah. And so I'm in interested to see how it will go. Um, when I was trying to, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I just thought it was crazy that Jack snuck up on Hawkeye. Hawkeye is supposed to be the ninja, the ghost. Right. And I think that shows Jack's capability. I think he's going to be a greater threat than we think where he's just, just kind of like, you know, goof off, you know, smiling his goofy smile. I think as alluded to in the fencing scene, he's going to be somebody to be, uh, to be dealt with. Yeah. And that's one of the things that movies will do often. They'll, like, we don't have time or maybe they want to keep the backstory hidden and all of this, but they just give you clues like, Oh, well this person beat that person. So that they're up here. And here's like, they're just giving us lots of clues to say no jack is a tough dude don't sleep on like don't just forget about him because he can kill you in your sleep yeah uh, one side note i when i was trying to look up jack's name i couldn't remember i went to this website that's like oh yeah here's a cast and character guide um it looks like um natasha's sister will be on the in this and no she's spoilers. played these are spoilers She's played by my sister, what? Florence Pugh. What? I'm convinced we're relatives somewhere. I don't know. So, yeah, yeah. she was in um, uh, the Black Widow movie. Uh, we know that she's going to come. There's been uh, some talk. I, I try to stay away from the forums, but a lot of the forums are talking about how uh, they're putting together, you know, the rest of Phase Four and uh, Kate Bishop. Uh, who becomes, oh, I forget her superhero name. Uh, I, some people say she takes on the Hawkeye mantle. Some say she's going to become kind of her own, but she's going to team up under the um, team that Val is putting together. And we saw Val at the end of Captain America and Winter, uh, Winter Soldier, or Falcon and Winter Soldier, which becomes Captain America and Winter Soldier. So uh, yeah, Black Widow's sister is going to be part of that team. Apparently she is going to make a cameo in this episode. Spoiler alert, or in this- but uh, The only movie. thing that's important, the only reason I bring her up is because she's played by Florence uh, Pugh. Pugh. So Pugh. we just got to- You want to- Yeah, she's my long lost sister that I didn't know about. I, well, I don't know when we're going to see Ben's long lost <laughs> sister in the series, but I can't wait to, wa wait to watch the next episode. And we'll see you guys with our post-show commentary here on Hero Thoughts. Yep. Talk to you guys soon.